I got another video to post. However, I want to do a little self-promotional stuff. I got two things that I'm working as far as like support effort or things that would support my content. And the thing about me that you should probably know is I got a, um, I'm plagued with curiosity, so to speak, where I have a lot of different things I'm interested in. So I got two projects that I'm working on, um, not, not four, two, but uh, one of them is the My Air Image Project, which is shooting um, aerial photos and doing stories of and about in for Nebraska. And that's got a Patreon. So if you want to support it through aerial images, you can go through the Patreon for that, which is in the description down below. And I also have this other project, which is sort of a silly commentary on fitness and vanity and and dedication and discipline and all that stuff. And it's called SuperheroSizeMe.com, which also has a Patreon. So if you wanted to support my content or stuff that I do, um, and you want to see more aerial images or stories, you can go to the Patreon for that in the description, or you can go to the Patreon for SuperheroSizeMe.com, which is kind of a no holds bar. Let's see how fast and radical um, these body transform transformations can be done because you'll see these celebrities that say, you know, uh, I got this contract to be a superhero and then within six months I lost all this fat, put on all this muscle, and no one really knows the process. It's like, oh, I ate right and exercised. And it's like, well, what does that actually mean? So I want to document the entire process in weekly videos and blogs. So you can see more about that project on SuperheroSizeMe.com. Um, and if you just feel like don't want to do any of those things, but you feel like supporting. I also have a PayPal link, so you can leave a small tip, you know, buy me a gallon of fuel or something like that. So I can drive around and do another update uh, similar to this. Anyway, so appreciate the time and here's the video. Thanks. All right, so let's get to it. We're going to start off really wide so anyone outside the state of Nebraska can see or understand the kind of context of what we're looking at. We have three rivers that kind of short form up in this area. We have the Platte River down south here. That's the Elkhorn River with the thumbtacks that we're going to go look at. And Nebraska is made up, or the border with Nebraska and Iowa is the Missouri River right here. Most of the stuff I was able to do was all the Elkhorn River because I was closest to me and access at the time of the flood was obviously very limited. Down south is where we're going to end up. Last is Arlington with Highway 30. And then we'll be over by Nickerson Fontenelle taking a look at the Highway 91, Scribner. Uh, it says Scribner Herman Road, but the locals call it County Road F. We're going to look at County Road F on the east side of Scribner. There's some old footage there we'll take a look at and then compare it to today. As well as the lake over by West Point on the northwest corner of West Point across the river. There's an irrigation pivot that I've shot recently uh, before. We're going to take a look at that to see what's changed. That I feel kind of exemplifies or demonstrates what's happening to a lot of farm ground across the state. And we'll start off with Beamer. What I want you to notice is this little oxbow here that we've shot before. If you're not familiar with it, that's uh, that's been compromised, as well as this group of trees here. Uh, that group of trees kind of forces the river to go uh, to the upper right corner against that dirt. And then it swirls in that little oxbow, which is kind of eating the dirt away going towards that road. And this is like the only access you have to the south side of Beamer across the river. So that's what that oxbow looked like shortly after the floodwaters receded. And it, we are shooting from uh, immediately above the bridge. So the speculation is if that was allowed to keep eating away into that field, eventually it's going to carve a new path going to the right side of the screen it's going to cut off that field and then cut through to that road, which limits the access to Beamer on the south side. So they need to find out how to correct that. And like I said, that group of trees that I was talking about to focus on, that is dead center in the screen right now. You'll notice a lot of those trees are being uh, chopped down. They're sort of doing their Paul Bunyan thing. And the speculation I have, I haven't spoke with anyone in the area, but what it appears to be the strategy is to remove all those trees and then cut a path to alleviate some of the river's pressure to the, the that oxbow or that, that cutting into the field. And right now it doesn't look as bad because it's all frozen. 
my guess is since it's probably a little bit shallower there and maybe there's not as much movement, it's it freezes easier. But what I want you to notice is see how those beans that were planted are cut off as they drop into the water. That tells me at one point the farmer was able to plant beans there because it was corn during the flood. It was harvested corn, like corn stalks were there. So he had planted beans and then from the time that he planted them to the time he was ready to harvest, all that had been cut away. So the problem had persisted well after uh, the spring and the planting and as he was about to go harvest. So, like I said, the plan it looks like is to remove all the trees here and then cut that section away to allow the river to redirect some of its force down below. So I don't know what the ultimate goal is. In my opinion, like it looks like that might be a little bit too narrow for uh, redirecting some of the river. So I don't know if the plan is to uh, eventually remove all the trees and the stumps and then eventually... Uh, remove or start widening it out, but leaving that little path. It looks like trucks are using that path to get in and out of that work area. Um, like So there's enough evidence to suggest what the plan is, but not so much as to say what it's going to look like after it's all said and done. But that seems to be the, the current strategy to try to alleviate the, the problem with the field being eaten away and cutting off towards the road. So instead of trying to block the river, maybe they're just going to try to redirect it. So that was an interesting observation. That's something I did not anticipate to find. I thought maybe they'd try to somehow abate it elsewhere. Moving on, though, we'll go down to this uh, irrigation pivots that was kind of popular in other videos. It Because I feel like this most dramatically, dramatically shows what's happening. That cursor is kind of showing where the first leg of the irrigation pivot is. All that ground is now gone. The river had moved and carved its way to the northeast. In the left third of the screen, you'll see the center pivot there. And you'll see how much sand had been dumped onto this field. This was immediately after the floodwaters receded. I had done a follow-up video to this one that was maybe, I think, five months after the floodwaters where it now looks like this. You'll notice the first leg of the pivot's there, but the center pivot is now in the river. It's hard to tell since it's frozen and there's snow on top of the ice, but that is now in the river. And you'll notice that hard uh, embankment that shows where the river is currently at. And then everything from that center pivot almost off to those that tree line up to the top of the screen, the river was up towards that tree line. That was the original path. So that farmer, I believe, I think when I did the math in the previous video, it was close to 50 some acres that were either covered with sand or fallen into the river as it continually carves against that soil. Since it's soft soil and the trees were wiped out that formed the embankment, there's no roots to give it strength to retain the soil. And so it's just all started falling in. Moving on, we're going to go to the lake that's just slightly down the river from there in northwest edge of West Point. What I want you to notice is how the Elkhorn River curves right there. And then there's these narrow bands that uh, separate the lake and the river. You have the, the water for the lake on the left separated by that narrow road. And then on the right side, you have the Elkhorn River. You'll have one at the top and then at the Far south end, you'll have one again that separates the uh, lake and the river. Kind of make a mental note of those two visuals from this Google Maps, because then when I go to this, this is uh, shortly after the floodwaters receded. In the left column of the video, you'll see that there's a breach. You'll see that little road that's going up, and there's that breach there. So on the left is where the Elkhorn River used to run. It would run up between that those two tree lines where all the sand is. And then on the, on the right side is the lake. You'll notice that there's a lot of uh, trees and debris that's scattered throughout the lake. I imagine once the, the trees were compromised, everything else kind of got washed away. 
I know there's some locals that were telling me that there's parts of this lake that were close to 40 feet deep. But once the river kind of broke through into the thing, as you noticed with the field that was north of this, uh, the river brings in a whole lot of sand. So I can't begin to calculate the cubic amount or cubic feet or yards worth of sand that was brought in. But that lake went from spots that were 40 feet deep to now like walking, like you could walk across it almost. Maybe not all of it, but quite a bit of it. This is what it looks like today. We are fly flying from the south end though. So at the top left of your screen is where you're going to notice the Elkhorn River is coming from the north down and then it goes, it used to go to the right. You'll see the, that uh, to the center and to the right of the screen is where the river used to run. We're looking at the lake here. Top center is the breach where the river used to run. And that valley or that little corridor of trees is the path of the river. There's a, another breach there where that road was. That's in the left column of your screen there. That's where the breach is for the road. This is all the lake. There hasn't been much that has changed from when I shot the last video. But I wanted to kind of get up there with the drone and do a full hundred full 360 degree pan around so people can see it at this point my battery alarm started going off and I wanted to get a shot there at the left center up to your screen you'll see that little shine on the water that's the lake going back into where the river is or the river having gone through the lake that's underneath us and then connecting back to the old river West Point is there underneath the the sunrise there so it's hard to see West Point because it's in that overexposed spot but now we are flying on the lake and headed back because I uh, had to recharge the battery. And then we moved on to further south, a little bit of a stretch down the road on 275. We got to Scribner. Scribner, you may remember, has that levee system that surrounds the entire town and worked very, very well. Uh, and we'll go back and look at a video of that shortly. But I want you to know this is a County Road F, which is also known as Scribner Herman Road that connects Scribner and it's a paved road all the way to Herman. But that levee system has a gate over 275 that's right here. This is me flying to that gate from the west end of Scribner. This is when the flood was almost at its highest, or I think it was at its highest at this point but it demonstrates how well that gate system and levee was working to protect the town of Scribner. But I guess, I mean, this is a good thing that it worked this well, but the, the side effect of a levee system like this is it also directs a lot of water around it. I feel like that might have an effect as far as this, uh, this kind of blowout area that we're going to take a look at here soon. Because once the river rises, if it's blocked by all this levee, it's either going to go around it to the west or go around it to the east, which you'll notice here, the river tends to uh, exit out right there where that uh, there's no embankment. There's like nothing to show that that's the edge of the river. And that has existed for quite a while. This That was still there. As you can tell, it's on Google Earth. So it was there before the flood because these Google Earth images are before the flood. But looking at this old video from immediately after the flood waters have receded, you can kind of tell how since there's a part of the river bank that's weakened or just non-existent, the, it's going to want to escape out there as often as in, and as intense as it wants to. And what you're noticing is how that sand is kind of pushed across the hayfield. You got a sense of like how the river was running over this farm ground. Fortunately, it didn't wipe out any of the, the paved road, which is unheard of. In other areas, you will see that highway or that blacktop road uh, completely undermined. But in this instance, it actually fared fairly well. What I want to do, though, is fly kind of close to the ground and over the river so you can get a sense of what it's like if you were to walk across this field and then walk into the river. It's almost like a the same grade or slope as walking on a beach there's just no embankment with nebraska and all these creeks and rivers you're used to having some sort of embankment you have to crawl down to get into the river but here you don't and so i flew the drone both into it as well as coming back from over the river to the ground like we're over the ice that is the river 
and this is kind of showing you what it would be like if you were to walk it yourself. And I just wanted to get this shot so it would give you an impression or an idea of what it looks like if you were on the ground yourself. And then I, what I ended up doing was doing this wide shot as well so you can kind of get a, an idea of the relation of Scribner on your right, the bridge in the center, and then the river on your left. All right, now we're going to move south more towards uh, Highway 91 that goes between Nickerson on your left and Fontenelle on your right. Nickerson, I don't believe Nickerson had a lot of issues as severely as some other towns with flooding. The river went to the east towards Fontenelle, but Fontenelle is up a large slope right there where the cursor is and where that kind of those trees are. That's a really large hill. So Fontenelle was never really in danger of being flooded because it's at the top of like a bluff. However, where that river makes a C shape, it curves hard to the left and then comes back to the right. It escaped out right where the cursor is. And in the other videos, you'll notice where this section of Highway 91 was incredibly undermined and wiped away. There's a lot of rebuilding done in this area. Because once it escaped out there, it flew straight south and reconnected with itself once it curved back around. Because these rivers are notoriously windy and bendy. And I, I imagine that has an effect is where the damage is going to be done once they kind of break out of the banks. And the funny thing is when I was going through my old videos to kind of do the juxtaposition, I was confusing this section with the section of Scribner that we just saw previously because they look almost identical as far as a blacktop road that runs across and then another small road that runs uh, left to right on your screen. Scribner has the same kind of geographic setup. However, I don't know why it was so much more uh, destructive here when it comes to like the road damage the Scribner Herman road was fine there's like a lot of debris on it and you had to had the sand pushed off the road and cleaned up but you didn't have sections of it that were completely chewed away like you're seeing here you got cables that were buried either like alongside or underneath the road um, that were dug up and then slabs of concrete that were just washed away and this embankment I I think what they're trying to do, you'll see some dirt moving equipment there at the bottom of your screen. They're making more of an effort to like rebuild that river embankment. In the old video, that red barn, I know that had a lot of dirt washed out from underneath it. That house, that whole farm place had been flooded. Uh, they were in the, the brunt of it. And Parts of this farm ground had the sand deposited all over it so they couldn't farm it this year. They probably won't be able to farm it again for a while. And like you like you may notice right there, that hill that goes up along the trees, that's what I was talking about earlier. Fontenelle's at the top of all those trees uh, or that hill where all the trees are at. So Fontenelle was fine. But that section of road that I'm panning across now, all of that has been rebuilt and um cleaned up and similar to over at Scribner, I want to have a shot where I fly low over the ground and then into or over the river. And you can see the difference where at, at Scribner, you have no embankment or containment, so to speak, uh, where it differentiates between the river and the fields that it can flood into. And this one, you have an actual wall that the river has to rise up and over. Now, there's already concerns for 2020 that there's going to be high floods. I think the river's already higher than what they're supposed to be at this time of year. So, yeah, there's that containment of a few more feet. But what it ultimately means in the spring during the thaw and the rains, uh, it might not make a much difference or it might not be enough of a difference to uh, mitigate any potential floods for 2020. And something else that I think is worth knowing is I, you know, I never claim to be an expert, so I hope you don't confuse me to be an expert. I'm just trying to make observations. And that bridge up at the top of the screen, I've driven that bridge lots of times because I deliver hay to customers uh, down that road. And as many times as I've driven across it, I've never noticed the subtle changes of the rivers. And I think it's just with this flood that it's not just me, but a lot of other folks where when you see a flood that dramatic, the changes are so fast and violent 
you get a lot more um, observant uh, or you're more inclined to watch what's going on and you see the subtle changes. This shot, I feel, kind of gives you an impression of like some of those subtle changes where the river is starting to make a, a large bow curve action to the top of the screen. Like instead of curving back to the bridge, now you're seeing more of it going up against that field where there's no roots from trees to protect the erosion and there's really no embankment uh, that's artificial to protect it. So that's something I'm starting to notice more. That's what other people are starting to notice. And uh, we'll see what happens uh, when the spring comes with the thaw. Anyway, so down to Arlington or Highway 30 between Arlington and Fremont. This was one of those critical roads that was washed away. Pretty much everything you see south of the river in this screen was underwater during the flood. And most of this highway, if it wasn't entirely washed away, it was definitely undermined, which is as our water went from the north of the side of this river or the north side of the highway, which is top of the screen, and then over the road, it would peel out the dirt on the south side and turn and then dig out the soil underneath the concrete and it would drop the highway and wash it away. This was from the shortly after the floodwaters receded and it kind of demonstrates what happens on the right side is the north where the river is on the left side is the south where the river flowed to and as I said as the water went over the highway it would drop and that drop would create this hydraulic um, drop or hydraulic jump action and it would turn and swirl there and as it swirled it would peel away the dirt now how what was different in this spot particularly where it created a small lake i i don't know what was different in that particular area why the erosion was so much more severe but obviously you can tell uh, that was not an easy fix this was one of those roads that was critical to get opened again as well as the one we just saw over at highway 91 between nickerson and fontenelle because there's a lot of families or a lot of a lot of homes on the east side of the river that commute to fremont for work or services or anything of that nature and having both those bridges closed or both those highways closed made 15 minute commutes turn into 45 minute or one hour commutes because they had to go even further south or north to get across the the river so this is what it looks like today uh, not much that's noteworthy obviously you can tell it's been fixed and repaired and the highway is opened and traffic is flowing the one thing i wanted to notice or make you aware of is when you look at arlington here in the Elkhorn River as it curves off to your left side of the screen, it is parallel or somewhat parallel to the highway that's south of it. So the Elkhorn River is there, that's Highway 30. When that river flooded, everything you see in the screen now is pretty much underwater. And all those homes, if they hadn't been evacuated, I believe it was airboats and helicopters that had to evacuate people because there's just no way you're gonna drive there. Okay, so that wraps up our 2020 recap of the 2019 flood locations. I didn't get to everything I've been to before, uh, North Bend and Winslow. I haven't gone back to yet, but that gives you an idea of where we're at. Like I said, if you feel like supporting some of this content, check the description down below as far as the Patreon po projects or uh, a PayPal donation if you feel like it. So appreciate the time. Uh, thanks for watching. Have a good one and uh, best of luck for this coming spring because I feel like we may have this problem again. Okay, see ya.